Welcome to another episode of Matty Ice and Chief Patrick. We're back, and we're going to get back to a little bit more of our regular schedule. We've obviously been doing previews after preview after preview after preview. We're basically a movie in theaters. Now we're here to do an actual show the way our regular season uh, during football season goes. We're going to call that our regular season uh, goes. And Patrick, it is chock full of football, but how are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, didn't do a show last week. I think we're just getting our minds right. I think we're just settling in from the shockwave that is a full weekend of football that we just weren't used to. Well, I don't want to cast too much blame on my young daughter, but <laughs> she gave both of us a cold yesterday. I, why am I wearing my glasses? I never wear my glasses. I'll show. Um, she gave us a bit of a cold last week. So the Sindelar house was under a cold. Uh, my parents were actually in town. She didn't feel great. I didn't feel great. Um, my wife was out of town. So it was just kind of a, 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 a bad time to do it. Plus NFL football started. We didn't want to compete with that uh, on the first night. Cause they, everybody was going to be watching that, that uh, game, which lovely to see the Rams lose, by the way, uh, perfect start to the season for me. No, but so that's part of why we didn't have a show last week. It was just going to be a little bit uh, too much to try and figure out. So like Patrick said, we took a week off, but we're here. So Patrick, I'm going to, since we're back, I'm going to let you start uh, with our is back this week. So why don't you tell me what is back? So what I'm going to say is back is, and it, it could easily be a shame. But it's the fact that it's happened before is why it could – it's sadly is back. And that's racism in the NBA. You said that with more gusto like it should be a fun thing. It's obviously it's not. not. <laughs> and, you know, and you know what also was back? And I feel terrible for the guy is that Chris Paul plays for another racist owner. Because you think back when the Clippers dealt with the Donald Sterling situation, he was on that. Who was the locker room leader of that team? Chris Paul. And guess what? It's the same thing with him in the Suns. I oh. don't understand what he's done to deserve it. It makes no sense. Well, and then of course he was at Oklahoma City, which is just a crap fire of an organization. Um, hey, no, no, no! I love what they're doing over there. They've got. A hundred million draft picks that GM is gonna. Yeah, you know kill. who. You know whose organization that should be, Patrick. Well, I can't help that. That one I can't help. Mm -hmm. It should be in Seattle still. Um, yeah, that is your is back, and that's not great that we're having to deal with all that again in the NBA. You know what uh, makes no sense to me. This is what doesn't make sense to me, and maybe someone could explain it, but. You have the whole thing with Donald Sterling. He had to sell the team. You had the NBA had to spend who knows how much money and how much time and energy to do all of this like, research and investigation into Sarver. Basically the same thing. But he doesn't have to sell the team. When... Sterling had to sell a team. Yeah. Basically being a, a giant a-hole racist. So you know, my, you know my conspiracy theory on that? What is it? Because I want to know. And my conspiracy theory is that uh, 
that will eventually happen. He will be forced to sell the team, but I think he's going to be forced to sell the team the day LeBron James retires. So what does LeBron have to do with that? I think LeBron's going to be the head of the owner of leadership that buys that team. Oh, I don't think I think Can they'll draft him. Phoenix. I think they'll draft. Well, I mean, he's. I think I, it, it makes him. He would, he would just want to buy a franchise. I think him and Dwayne Wade both would want to. Because wait, Dwayne Wade's got Wade he, is part owner of Utah right now. Yeah, I. I think he's. I think LeBron James is looking at that, and you saw he came out and said something about it today, and yeah. and rightfully so. Look, he's the face of the NBA, so he should be saying something about it. And if anybody's going to get voices, it will be LeBron James. So I, this is one of the few times I'm actually on LeBron James' side. I'm not saying anything bad about him, but I think I think that he will push Adam Silver to uh, investigate it, but it's going to take a long time. Um, and when they sell the team, when he's forced to sell the team, when the sell becomes final, I think you'll find out that LeBron James has uh, some stake in it. If not the lead, the I'm not going to say the majority owner, because I don't know how much the Phoenix Suns are worth at this point to know if LeBron James has enough money to do that. I assume LeBron James has in basically prints money. Um, so he's probably fine. He'll just go get some money from China. If nothing else, uh, that was a shot at LeBron. Sure. And this is from two days ago, which is ironic, but it says they're worth one point eight billion. LeBron has that. Oh, LeBron, yeah. LeBron has that. LeBron has that, and if not, somebody could give it to him. Somebody would give it to him so that he could buy. Um, if he doesn't have that full amount, watch him work out a, a new deal with Nike <laughs> to get to get the rest of it. Yeah, because he's got the he's got the one we know. Right. It's well known he's got the one. Whether he has the point eight, don't know. But he can get he can get some of his buddies, whether it's former yeah. players or or um, actors or, or friends in he's got enough business. friends. Like yeah. they can join in and get the and pick up the rest of the tab. Now, I, the, so the only caveat to that is I don't know when Bronny is going to be in the NBA, and I don't know if they would allow. LeBron James to be an owner player at the same time. Maybe they would. Maybe they, uh, maybe they would. Maybe they would, and maybe maybe something gets involved and they make a trade. Like somehow they make a trade and he becomes the Phoenix Sun and then is allowed uh, or yeah. buy the team and trades himself or something somehow. I don't know, but I I think I could see that being something. If not, look, LeBron James, you're not listening to the show, but you probably should be. Well, actually, you probably don't want to be most of the time because I'm. We pick on your bed. Say good things about you, so maybe not. I, yeah, I say some things about you, but I, I think it's so weird to me. Like it would make sense for him to push to be an owner in the league, and now would be a good time to push for that because look, yeah, it, and not to not to like break it down into he's gonna own a team. Well. I got a guy who's been racist, right? Who owns the franchise? What better way, if you're the NBA, to clean it up and say, dude, you got to sell it. And by the way, we're going to give it to this African-American man who is one of the leading voices in the culture, one of the leading voices, maybe in America, even in, in terms of like celebrities, that is also African-American and LeBron James. And I think it would be, <laughs> excuse the pun, a slam dunk uh, for the NBA in that way. And you can you can work out everything else that needs to happen player wise because obviously he can't play for LA and be a part owner of the Phoenix Suns. But I, I think even if it was like, he has a majority stake, but like he can't be involved in, in the day to day or anything until he retires, like something like that. I, I think it would make a lot of sense to have LeBron James come in and buy that franchise. Yeah. And I mean, I like the theory because I think that would be, Good for the NBA, uh, for one to have another uh, African American owner, and then two just for LeBron James. Um, I hope it turns out better than like Michael Jordan owning Charlotte because I mean, they've been mediocre at best for a long time. Um, but <laughs> so, it's, you want my opinion on that? 
just without taking the like without um putting the microscope back on it it just still just doesn't make sense that we have the exact same thing the only thing that we don't have is audio it's the same thing when players get in trouble right. whether it's like getting arrested for something domestic disputes um you name it if there's video it's always quicker or there's audio discipline comes quicker because everyone has the yeah. proof the tangible proof audio is not tangible but you know what i mean so they did the investigation and all the stuff's come out which just proves everything that came out years ago but we don't have pictures of anything we don't have video of anything we don't have audio like everything was sterling that happened there's because there's plenty of audio i remember hearing the audio there's no audio in this case so that play a part in it it's like absolutely and, and here's why because if you and i were to sit here and obviously we're not going to but if you and i were to sit here on this live stream which by the way we're live now so if you're still listening to the podcast version great awesome but the live version on facebook uh, and then the video version that eventually goes on YouTube, Matty Ice and Chief for both of those things, um, is a great way to watch the show um, and actually get to hear us uh, talk and see Patrick make faces when I say crazy things. But if you and I were to sit here and, or if I were to sit here, let's use me because you actually as a Native American would be <laughs> a minority. If I were to sit here and scream a bunch of Native American slurs at you. Like to say the R word? Yeah, the Washington R words, if I were to call you that, like there would be so like people would get a hold of the video. Like we, we don't have necessarily a ton of viewers, but somehow we, that would be like the most viewed clip of anything we've ever done. Right. And people go, oh, look, clearly this guy, he's racist. We saw him do it. He has no excuse. Like there's nothing it, when it's done behind closed doors. Like it's so much easier for um for him to have plausible deniability. Like if I, you know, if you and I were, you know, in private text talk, talking to each other and I called you the Washington R words, like, okay. It, it, even if you said it, if you said, Hey, Matt called me this on in a text the other day, like you can say, no, I didn't. I can say, no, you didn't. And people, and you could even show, really, you could even show that text on, send the screen or show the screenshot and people, well, you could fake that. Like, yeah. you have video and audio, it's impossible to fake. And I think that's the difference. And, and so, you know, it, it, it makes sense in the grand scheme of things. Like, it's not as blatantly obvious and it doesn't, there's not that sound bite, right? Like we all love like, you know, the, what, how many times have coaches probably said more ridiculous things than playoffs, but yet, you know, anytime the playoffs roll around, because that video is a thing that exists, we all talk about that so much more. So I, it's, it's almost, almost unfortunate in a sense that there's no uh, video evidence or, you know, like, picture evidence or, or whatever, because then then things would probably move up, have moved quicker and probably been a little bit more drastic. And mm -hmm. boy, I, that, I think that gets into a whole, was David Stern still around when, 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 when Donald well, Sterling happened? Yeah. No, because was, um, that was kind of like his first true test. That was silver. Okay. okay. So um, Silver was – because I don't want to be even the commissioner for a full year. Yeah. And then that happened. So it was – Silver was really put to the test. So I think that whole uh, Donald Sterling thing happened. That might play into it a little bit, the fact that that was so quick after he got the job. And now you look at it, and he's done it with one guy. And because – you know, you start talking about commissioners of leagues and, and they're essentially the boss, you know, that we talk about it with Roger Goodell all the time. Like his bosses are the NFL owners. It's not, you know, anything else. It's the NFL owners. And, and you know, Adam Silver ultimately reports to the NFL owners in a lot or the NBA owners in a lot of ways, because if they're not happy, he's probably not going to have a job. Um, and, and so I think maybe, you know, the first one, it's obvious there's video evidence. Like we talked about, it makes sense with Donald Sterling. It's your, it's the first year you kind of put your foot down, 
you know, you say, ah, this is the hard line, this is where we draw it. And then, you know, maybe, you know, now Adam Silver's been in the job a while. He's a little bit more comfortable. He's like, ah, this one's a little bit more gray. There's not a, <laughs> excuse the color pun there. Um, <laughs> like, hey, it's a little bit more gray. Yeah, he did it. So I'm going to, I can, I can do it enough that I can find him and he'll write a check and be whatever. And people will talk about it and be okay, whatever. And that's great. That's awesome. And he's done with it. Like, but I, I think oh. that might be where we're at with that. It's just so weird to me, and we can end it here because we we got so much football to talk about. Yeah, but it's just so weird to me that like the punishment is you pay ten million dollars. Well, if he owns the Phoenix Suns, it's not going to do much to him. And then I'm talking about he's suspended for a full year, basically just can't do anything Sun related. Well, that doesn't really hurt him much because you know what would hurt him the most is not being able to profit off the Suns. Yeah, because that's that's the main thing. He still is technically owner, and while he loses ten million dollars, he's going to make that ten million pretty quick off of every home game. So, in the grand scheme of things, he didn't. That's what no one's talking about. Like, yeah. did he really get punished that much? Uh, no, and I think the problem with the problem with punishing an owner in general. This is where we can leave it. The problem with punishing an owner in general is you can do one of two things. You either punish them enough that it hurts the franchise. But if you hurt the franchise, you're hurting the league. And especially when the franchise right now is the Phoenix Suns. And the Phoenix Suns are a darn good basketball team. And they've got a lot of young talent. They've got a lot of good talent. And if you punish them too much and that team suffers, well, then now you've got a team that's not as good. And you don't necessarily want that. But if you don't punish them enough, then you end up – you know, okay, like you said, this is well, is it really doing anything? And I think that's a hard balance to strike. Um, and it is what it is. That was good as back, Patrick. That got us a long ways. Luckily for us, mine are very short. Um, because my first is back, Patrick, is Brownie the Elf. Uh, back on the field, the Cleveland Browns putting Brownie the Elf back on the field. Uh, if you haven't, I, that's one of my favorite. That's one of those great, like, terrible 1960s. Is it was the 60s era, I guess? Um, sure we talked about it during, I mean, two summers ago. It was definitely during like COVID era when we talked about. We, I feel like we did like a month segment worth of logos, and I'm sure we talked about Brownie the Elf during that. At some point, yeah, I, I'm sure we did, and it, that is uh, uh, just a cool. It, I love that era of like bad bring it back too. Yeah. yeah, so you you get your first win, you you beat um, your former quarterback. Who I mean, it's not like he did them wrong in any way, but. You know, you beat Baker on the road, get your first win, and then oh, you bring in Brownie the Elf back. Yeah, which is which is what their fans want. So that's obviously great. Patrick, the other is back. I'm wearing the shirt right now. I'm wearing it. Seattle Seahawks, baby, we're back. Uh, I want to know we're at FC leaders right now. Uh, we're going to the Super Bowl. No, nah, I look. I <laughs> joking. I we're not going to the Super Bowl. If we do, I'm fine with it. But um, you know, it's exciting. To, <laughs> it's exciting to see. Uh, Seattle get the the first win on Monday night, especially uh, over Russ, who I am now officially. Look, now that he's been back, he's officially no longer a Seahawk. Like he can be booed. You know, a lot of people had. Tri- what do you? I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up because I have not mentioned that at all to you. Like we have not talked about the booing. Russ, so what are your what as a true. Seahawks fan, and as a true Russell Wilson fan, I know we had an entire show dedicated to that trade. So every, anybody can go back on on whatever you listen to the podcast on and listen to that show where you gave your true thoughts <laughs> on everything involved, on Russell leaving, on Seahawks moving forward, what they're going to do now. Like, you laid it all out there. So Seahawks fans – Russ comes back, gets booed. I need to know what you think. Hey, here's what I think on it. I think, I think what should have happened is there should have been maybe, maybe you do it pregame. Like a tribute video, or, or you're saying? I I think what should have happened 
is there should have been a tribute video and the fans should have collectively known about it. And when the tribute video was up pregame, you cheer him, you give him a standing ovation. He's the best quarterback that the franchise has ever had. I mean, took you two one year Super Bowl. Won a Super took two took us two Super Bowls. Yeah, one, two, got you one. One one probably should have been more if you know. We had, know. Carol, yeah. go back and listen to that. Two. My problems, but. So I think that should have happened. Give him a standing ovation. When he comes back to be put into the ring of honor, give him a standing ovation. However, once the game starts, and, and really once the team, once the Broncos come out onto the field, I have no problem with him being booed because he is now the enemy. Now, so, yeah. The, and, and the so, talk, I, I have some buddies at work. We were talking about this on Monday. And someone said exactly that because you think about when Tom Brady went back to New England. Whenever he was a Bucks, went back to New England his first season uh, with Buccaneers. They did exactly that. They did a tribute video with, you know, showing all the Super Bowls he brought in, all the great moments. They cheered him on. They recognized everything he did for the Patriots. But as soon as that game started, he's no longer a Patriot. He is a Buccaneer. Booze. Yeah. Because he is trying to beat your team he's no longer part of that team he's trying to beat you now so at that point you can boo him you acknowledge all the contributions that he had done from from yeah. start to finish and you let him come back you said thank you for everything you all collectively said thank you recognize his achievements but then as soon as the whistle blows if the ball's kicked off you're in the trenches hey it's a new era now and you're no longer a part of it Right, and I, I think I, from a fan's perspective, that's the way I've tried to approach it. Yeah. Um, it just in general, like I, because I do, I, I, I think, I, man, it's and I, I love the Seahawks, but the fan base is kind of crappy in a lot of ways. Um, it reminds me, and it's a different situation, but man, it all I could think about was when in that preseason game in Indianapolis, all the fans in that game found out that Andrew Luck was retiring. Boot him off the field at that point. It's like, dude, y'all are trash. Yeah. And, and so part of me, I've had a bit, especially like on Seahawks Reddit, like all all summer, all all spring, like had a bit of a problem with the way Seahawks fans have approached it of like, oh, well, this guy's a loser. Like he was the entire problem. Now that he's on, everything should be fine. Like I, I think a lot of people, I mean, look, it, it's, it's a bad, I know it's not you who think that, but. right? It's a bad breakup, and I think that's the thing to remember is it's it's a it's a divorce, and it's a bad divorce, and it's a messy one. Um, but I think like you know to sit here and and act like there weren't good times and, and that Russ wasn't good. Like again, boo him once the game starts, and boo him when the team comes out because he's a Bronco. Yeah. But I, I think there should have been a moment, a little bit of a cathartic moment, even. Yeah. And maybe in the fourth quarter, it would have been, I think, hilarious to have done it and done it in the fourth quarter when the Broncos are trying to win. Like during the timeout that they were they took to kick the field goal, it would have been really funny if there was a tribute video and then they kicked them like missed the kick uh, the game winning field goal. Um, that would have been a great troll. Uh, I like I, th I think you know I think at some point there should have been a tribute, a recognition of what Russ was to the organization, what he was to the team. Other than that, boo the crap out of him. Like he is, he's a Denver Bronco. I, I think, and we'll end it here. We'll talk college football because we need to talk college football. But I, football, I'm pretty sure uh, we just saw Mike Williams touchdown here for San, or San Francisco or for uh, San Francisco. here with a little bit of, of pass interference there from the defense going in. Um, I think it would have all played out differently had this not been the first game of the season. I think it being the first game of the season and there being so much bad blood, so to speak, going into the game, I think is part of the reason he was booed immediately. I think maybe if it's later in the season or if this is the first game next year, maybe there is that more of that moment. Because, it, it, you know, Peyton Manning is a, is a good example, but it's also a bad example because he got cut because of the injury. And it, it all made sense. When, when Peyton got cut, it made sense. It was like, okay, like he's on the very end of his career. You can get Andrew Luck. 
dude broke his neck. We don't know if he's going to be any good. And he, I mean, look, he he, he, play. neck surgery wasn't yeah. great. Um, he still got to a Super Bowl, yada, yada, whatever. But I think that, you know, it makes it a little bit different when he went back to Indianapolis um, because there wasn't the, hey, I need to get traded. Uh, and again, go back and listen to that if you need my thoughts on what actually should have happened. But long story short, I, I'm okay with it. I think that he should have got booed as soon as he came out with the team, with the Broncos. Maybe, pre, again, maybe pregame you do a, a tribute video or something and people can cheer and stand up and you clap and say thank you. But then as soon as game, it's game time, so to speak, you let it go and and, and you, you get vicious. I mean, it's you're Seattle. You're a good home. You're a smart, intelligent home crowd for football. You, know, you can be a little bit mean and, and, and do whatever. Patrick, those are his backs. Let's get in now to our college football picks because, you know, last week we had a bit of a wild week. Uh, what is oh, Texas? Or I guess Texas is back to losing games. I mean, they play good, um, but we will always horns down. Uh, horns down in this house. We, where there, there's horns down in this house always. Um, but we got some picks for this week. And if you're in our college pick them, it's not too late to join that college pick them. Matty Eisen, Chief 2022 over there. Uh, you will be behind and you will probably lose my wife because she is. Well, you're going to lose even if you start a game, game very game one. Uh, yeah. Don't, I, you can probably still beat Patrick because he'll miss a week at some point mm-hmm. and he'll make some bad picks, yada, yada. Uh, but Patrick, so we're going to go through them and I actually have it pulled up in order before the way the games are on ESPN before you make your picks. Um, and then we can talk about where our confidence is maybe in some of these games. But look, let's start. My wife will be proud. Uh, she's already in bed. But let's start with OU at number six, uh, 2-0, taking on Nebraska. Patrick, I don't think this one's going to take much to talk about. Oklahoma's looked pretty pretty okay at least, not played a ton of competition yet. Uh, they've looked decent. They've three good halves. They've had, yeah, I, three good halves. One a little bit shaky, which makes sense. You got a new coach, new uh, new organization, so to speak. Uh, so that that's going to happen. But Patrick Nebraska playing in the post Scott Frost era. Um, do they get a new? Do they get a coach by your bump? That's the question. I, man, this is so. She's asleep, so she can't hear me. This is a bit of a trap game. Like yes, it is, of course it is. OU has no business losing this game. No business losing this game. But, Patrick, this is a trap game for them because, and I'm trying to get the full schedule up to remember, uh, you know, where this goes. But you're coming on. ECU. I think they have a bye. No, no, no. After this game. No, no. They have TCU. No, no, no. They've got a game after this. They've got K-State, oh, they which is a team that always gives them. So look at this. You've got – you come off Utah and Kent State, two easy wins for you. You played rough in one of those quarters against um, Kent State. Against Kent, oh, really, the first half against Kent State. Yeah, exactly. Then you play Nebraska. At Nebraska, who's got the new coach bump, shouldn't matter because you should still beat them. We should still beat them. But then you've got Kansas State at TCU – and then you play Texas. Then you play the big one. And that, man, this game has a little bit of a trap feel to it because Kansas State's always going to give you trouble. TCU could give you some trouble. This Nebraska team has no business giving you trouble. But if you start off slow against this Nebraska team, it could be iffy. I'm not going to do it, though. I'm going to pick OU in. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. All that to be said. But this is the this is the part of the season that OU really has to be careful with yeah. because this is when they typically kind of have a dip because it's pre Texas, uh, it's pre UT, and that always gets a little bit sketchy. Now, Patrick. That being said, this is my number ten uh, in confidence. I've got this as my ten pointer. So this is not my ten pointer right now. This is my number eight. Mm. I have, obviously, if you do math, two games above this one. But I obviously have it pretty high, but it's not my 10. So you got your eight. All right, Patrick, 
Next up, we got number 12, BYU, taking on number 25, Oregon, at 2.30 p.m., which is a weird start time for this game. You got two West Coast teams, essentially. I, I'm not sure I like it. This, to me, is maybe – is this our game of the week? Are we going to call this our game of the week? We didn't discuss this pregame. It should be. Do, do it want, should be. Because this want. is a pretty down week, which I feel like week three historically is – yeah, bad, okay, Patrick, it's got to happen then. <laughs> this is the game of the week. Then I, yeah, I, this is you mentioned. This is a bad week. Not what? Oh, not a bad week because it's college football. There's always good weeks, and usually yeah. you end up having good stuff happen. You but know. The, this is the week where teams like Alabama play teams like ULM. They, they play one heavy non-conference game, and then they're going to play, you know, a, a week one to get into um, the SEC season. And, and you know, a yeah, lot is, of people doing this. this so, is week, week three is typically where teams earn their paychecks. Yeah, so this, this is going to be – Where athletic departments earn a good chunk of their budget. Yeah, so this is an interesting matchup because – I and look – Bo Nix has kind of done Bo Nix things, which means he's not been crazy good, but he's been fine. Um, 450 yards through two games, uh, five touchdowns, two interceptions. So he's that is the uh, future face of the excess XFL, right? uh, probably. Um, on the other side, Hall's been pretty good, uh, 48 to 71, 520 yards, only three touchdowns, one interception. Um, so this is you know this is an interesting matchup between teams that. Man. Well, Oregon's not been playing great pass defense so far. They've been stopping the run really well. BYU has been playing good defense. Um, obviously, they played real good against Baylor last week. They played pretty good uh, against South Florida open season. This – you can't put a team like BYU on upset alert when it's 12 versus 25. Exactly. But I think BYU wins this game. I, I think they've got just enough on defense to, to – Give Bo Nix a hard enough time that yep. that they managed to pull out the win. So I don't mean to look ahead, but anytime I see BYU, I can't help but think about this game. Arkansas plays BYU later in the year at BYU, and I know it's going to be a night game. I don't have good feelings about it. No, I don't either. I don't, like. I don't. Everybody can look ahead to the Alabama game, like that, and I'll be in attendance. That's going to be a crazy environment. Everybody can look ahead to, oh, maybe we can beat Texas A&M again. They're down. Maybe we can look ahead to whatever. Like, how about let's look at the fact that I am not confident at all <laughs> playing at BYU. Yeah, probably a night game in that environment. I'm sorry, like, that's going to be really tough. So looking at this matchup, I know it's at Oregon. I know it's an early kick. Oregon's just weird right now. Like they have a new coach. They're trying to get things established. It doesn't help that they're getting things established with Bo Nix. That's not doing you any favors. I understand that you really didn't have a quarterback. It's better than nothing, but it's better than nothing. Like obviously your star quarterback right now is playing literally tonight. For the Los Angeles Chargers, and you didn't yeah. really have an answer after that life after Herbert. So, I mean, you could do a lot worse than Bo Nix to solve that problem. Like, but you could do a lot better. Would but, you rather have a, a Corolla, a '93 Corolla, or a bicycle? Exactly. You have a '93 Corolla. Corolla's gonna get you there faster. That you're not gonna get there in style, but it's gonna get you there faster. Bo Nix is the Bo Nix Corolla of quarterbacks. I think I love that. <laughs> that is exactly what he is. If uh, so we had merch, we would have a, a just a shirt of a Corolla. We may, we may have, on, have some catchy name like the Bo Nix Express or something. We, we may work on. We may start working on some some merch for things like that. Um, even if it's just, even if it's just quotes, uh, I, I like the Bo Nix. Bo Nix is the '93 Corolla of quarterbacks. Uh, so you picking BYU here? Yeah, I'm picking BYU. I'm not gonna say I'm very confident in it, 
Um, He's my two. I mean, I, I there's a couple that I'm a little less confident in, so I have it at a four. Yeah. Okay. That's so I'm still not overly confident. Um, I've got three games that are kind of in that same tier for me of yeah. unsure, uh, and and they're just they're there that for me. Next up, Patrick, also at two thirty. We got number twenty-two Penn State taking on surprisingly number or surprisingly two and zero Auburn. Um, I look, Penn State has not looked great, but they looked okay. Um, when Sean Clifford has been on, Sean Clifford's fine. When Sean Clifford's not on, Sean Clifford is Sean Clifford. Um, that being said, I I think the Auburn train is going to run out at some point. Uh, and I think that this is the game that they lose steam on. I think this is the game Penn State um, comes out and wins. This. I think Penn State's able to run the ball on them a little bit. I know nobody's really run on Penn State or on Auburn yet, but they played Mercer and San Jose State, uh, and they barely beat San Jose. Uh, you know, powerhouses in the run game. Yeah. Um, so give me uh, – Sean Clifford gives me Penn State to win this game. And I think well, – let me see where I have it at real quick. Um, I have this as my number six. Spawn on. I have it at six as well. So, I mean, you kind of you mentioned there with the schedule, like Mercer, they did what they're supposed to. San Jose State, they really struggled, and they were actually down for a good chunk of that game against San Jose State. They were able to pull it away, you know, twenty-four to sixteen win. Like yeah. San Jose State's not a bad team, but. You should still – you're an SEC caliber team. And I say that as a fan of a team who threw four interceptions against San Jose State and lost at home to San Jose State. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I mean, I know what I'm saying. I understand that from an Arkansas perspective. But you're still a dominant – should be dominant SEC team. You should have been able to beat them. In a similar fashion than he did in Mercer. Yeah. Let's just be honest. So, and I just think Penn State, while, I mean, they're kind of the same as Oregon in the sense that, you know, yeah. are they going to dominate and put a ton of points on the board? No. But they're going to be able to control the ball against teams that we know that they're better. Like, Georgia's its own beast. Like, Georgia right now is the best team. In the yeah. We only know. So, like, I don't really count the Georgia game in the sense that Georgia was going to do that to everyone. Yeah. Probably everyone. So, I mean, you whatever. You erase that one from your brain. Like, I think that against similar opponents or, quote-unquote, lesser opponents, Pence, I, Pence hit can be able to control the ball, I think, you know, Oregon can control the ball on their own. I, I'm not going to say it's going to be a, a dominant win, but I'm, I'm confident in saying that they're going to win. I have this as a six as well. Yeah, I think you're kind of looking at like a 34-17 sort of game. Um, maybe yeah. they scores late uh, to make it look a little bit worse than it actually is uh, on the final scoreboard. But I also think Penn State is not really ever – worried about the final outcome another game patrick where somebody's not going to be worried about the final outcome next up colorado zero and two taking on minnesota two and oh minnesota wins this is my number 10 this is my nine see i mean i understand like oh you nebraska whatever like there's a reason why this is my number 10 colorado points from these two patrick that's all i'm saying colorado freaking sucks hmm I'm not saying Minnesota's great, but Minnesota has no business at home losing to Colorado. It's yeah. my number 10 for a reason. <laughs> All right, Patrick, next up, we've got the college game day game. So maybe this should be the game of the week, but I actually don't think it is because yeah. the opponents is good. Troy at 1-1 one and one, taking on Appalachian State, who is also 1-1. One one. They probably shouldn't be 1-1. One one. Um, should have managed to beat UNC. Um, yeah. I, I think this is a – you look at the picks, I think people are going to kind of freak out um, in in terms of Appalachian State because they won last week against Texas A&M 17-14, um, lost by two points to UNC the week before, should have really probably won that game. 
I, I think people are going to look at that and go, ah, this should be an easy game. App State should win this by 60. Move on. I don't think it's quite going to be that. Troy hasn't been great the last couple of years, but they play pretty solid defense. Uh, yeah. and, and look, this is a common opponent. Like this isn't, you know, I, I think part of the, when you see a team like App State beat somebody like Texas A&M, part of the problem is that Texas A&M goes in a little overconfident. Jimbo Fisher, who's a terrible coach, by the way, with his $80 million recruiting class, thinks they can go in there and win every single game against a team like App State, even though, you know, we've all seen the video eight million times of App State blocking the kick and beating Michigan back in the day. It's ingrained in our brains at this point. And no, that's not the same team, but this is – Look, App State has been a good team for a long time. We're obviously Sun Belt grads uh, who went through we went through years of them being in the Sun Belt. We've watched a ton of App State football. Like we know this is a good team. So you and I were not shocked when they beat AM. You and I were laughing when they beat AM. Um, because it's always great to see AM lose, but also because it's just not as shocking to a lot of people. It also will not shock me if Troy gives them a game. I think Chase Brown. Is is probably the best quarterback right now. Not probably. I think he is the best quarterback in the Sun Belt right now. He's better playing better than Grayson McCall at, at Coastal Carolina. Yep. Their offense is not going to struggle in this game a ton. Are they going to be able to stop the passing attack of Troy? Maybe. Maybe not. I, this I think has a has a feel of a Sun Belt shootout of it maybe of some weird things happening and it being like a 42, 45 sort of game. Um, I'm giving it, I, I think App State, App State, App State, apparently I'm Irish now. I think App State is the better team. I think they're going to win this game, but I don't think this, if you're not a Sun Belt fan, if you're watching this game because you got excited because of what App State did last week, don't be surprised if App State plays a closer game against Troy. Yeah. So what's, what's, um, Confidence-wise, what's this one for you? Eight. <laughs> I can't say much. It's a nine for me. I say all that to put them at eight. Yeah, so, I mean, you you make great points with all that. I mean, they held Ole Miss to 28 points. All, uh, in Ole Miss, they held them to 28. Yeah. So, I understand. I mean, Ole Miss is another team that you know, loaded up in the transfer portal. Let it up a lot on offense, so they're just they're still trying to find rhythm. But I still think if you are the Troy Trojans going to that atmosphere in Ole Miss and you hold them the 28 points, I don't care who's lining up for Lane Kiffin, I think that's a success. Yeah, I do. I think that's a success on defense. So I think they are going to give App State a little bit of trouble. I think App State is going to be riding high a little bit. I think maybe the first half they're going to go in, you know, it's game day. They're going to be a little cocky. We've seen what they did against UNC, putting up, you know, 60-plus points. We saw what they did at A&M, beating A&M. They're playing a Sun Belt team, a quote-unquote lesser Sun Belt team. They're going to probably go in thinking, you know, we're better than you guys. We probably should – should even be in the Sun Belt. We can obviously compete against P5 schools. Troy's going to hold them in the first half, and it's going to be a wake-up call. And then the second half is when I think they pull away. So I've, oh, we're both in agreement that this is going to be closer than you know the casual thinks because I see the points they put up. They see the win against a and They see game days there. Like, oh, it's a shoe-in. It's not a shoe-in. Well, I, but we still don't doubt that they will win. Here's the interesting thing. You and I both have a similar outcome to it. I think they're, it's going to be completely different how they get to it. I think there's going to be so much juice in that stadium that the first half, App State's going to be – Oh, just electric. Yeah, and I'm I, what I almost more worry about is that they're going to burn out a little bit and they start oh. second half – I can't. I Troy kind of starts coming back late. Yeah, I think Troy comes back a little bit, and then App State, right. being the better team, gets it back together and ends up winning it. But I think there's going to be so much juice in that stadium; it's going to be hard to control that first half. And then you get that first half, you get all that energy, and then you're going to have that adrenaline dump of the of halftime. And I think they're going to come out a little bit slow in the second half. 
okay. you know, let's say it's a 12 point ball game, something like that. Yeah. Come out in the second half and you're gassed. Uh, you know, that juice drop off happens happens i think you're looking at you know okay maybe you give up a touchdown and maybe you turn the ball over and troy gets field goal and something that's like all of a sudden it's like oh crap now we're in a little bit of trouble then you figure it out and you're fine i think that's where what i'm thinking is going to happen yeah. I, I, okay same result uh next up patrick uh mississippi state at two and oh taking on lsu who of course we know is one and one uh losing their opener um to florida state coming back and beating southern pretty soundly um yes. This is a weird game, Patrick, because I think both neither one of these teams has really played a good team yet. Um, Arizona, we know, is garbage. Uh, Memphis has been kind of crap. So, well, not kind of. They've been crap so far this year. And that was a weird game to start the season for Mississippi State. They Obviously, Mississippi State's going to pass the ball. And you could say LSU's played some pretty good defense so far, but they played Florida State, and they who's not great on offense. And they played Southern. So I don't know – this is a classic game, but these are two teams that I don't really know what they are yet at all. And I don't think either one of them know what they are yet at all. Yeah. Except for the fact that the team knows they want to throw the football and they're going to force it as much as they possibly can. You bank on the fact that LSU is kind of DBU and maybe they're able to, you know, make some things happen, get some turnovers. I'm going to take Mississippi State, though. I think Brian Kelly is a bit of a basket case right now. I don't think I never thought he was a great coach. I, I think he's a little. I'm not going to say shell shock's not the right word, but you could sense some frustration um, when he got called out by the reporter, uh, yeah. <laughs> which I loved, by the way. Um, that was hilarious. And, and this is also his first SEC game. Like this is a different ball game than playing Florida State. This is a different ball game than playing Southern. Like this is Mississippi State, a decent football team coming into your house and playing. And, and look, I think if LSU struggles, I think the fans will get on them early and the fans won't be happy. And I think that plays to Mississippi State's favor a little bit. If you're Mississippi State, you just have to play play your game and play solid. Just don't do anything stupid. Um, you got a, you got a veteran quarterback, quote unquote, now in, in Will Rogers, who's played a bit of football. Um, and I think I'm picking Mississippi State to win this game. It's my three on confidence, so it's very, very low. Um, because again, I don't know what these teams are really, but I'm taking Mississippi State. Yes, this is a two for me, mm-hmm. but I'm also taking Mississippi State. So Ooh. I mean, and I, I'm picking them because LSU is really we don't. I mean, you mentioned we don't know what type of team this is. So it seemed like for the first drive, they had success against Florida State. But then outside of that, I mean, they struggled against a mediocre Florida State team the entire game. Yeah. And I and I understand, you know, the transfers they brought in. They've got some key injuries um, that have come out the first two weeks. So, I mean, they don't really know what they are. Um, and I, that's a real interesting f- point to make for a lot of these schools who just brought in a ton of transfers. Like, just because you bring in those type of guys, that a lot of them, it doesn't, it, showing right now doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Because they haven't played together. Like, they've played in, you know, college football, in TAA football, but with other guys in different systems, different coaching schemes, different atmospheres. So it's like you just – it's taking kind of like a ragtag bunch of kids from, from you know, every different corner of the country, just loading them up and saying, look, we're going to go play a game. But that doesn't mean it's going to work. And it doesn't – it's definitely not going to work early. Mississippi State, it's not really the case. Like, this is a, a, a coach in his third year at Mississippi State who's really establishing his style of play, yeah. making sure that it can work in the SEC. And late last year, he kind of proved that, yes, this does work in the SEC. Yeah. You just haven't seen it yet. But I'm going to make sure that you do and make sure that, just like in other schools, I can win. Yeah. So. 
You know, he put up 49 points against Memphis. He put up 39 in a weird game against Arizona. Yeah. Which was basically midnight or whatever back in Mississippi when they played that game. So this is prime time against LSU. And an LSU team that they don't really know who they are. They don't really have a lot of confidence. It's our second game together. This is my number two in confidence points. So I don't really know what to expect in this game. Yeah. But I'm I'm giving the advantage to Mississippi State. And I can argue that I feel a little more confident now that I'm speaking, but I'm going to keep it at two. But yeah. I do think, you know, a Bulldogs take this. Always trust your gut. Uh, don't change your answers once you made them. Next up, Patrick, we got Texas Tech Raiders taking on number 16, North Carolina State. Both teams sitting at 2-0. and And look, Texas Tech has been an interesting team so far. They beat Houston in overtime. Uh, they play open season against Murray State. And you look on the other side, and North Carolina State struggled with ECU to start the season. You and I warned, I think, warned everybody about that, that that was a potential game to – hundred percent did. Go back and listen. We said that was a game to watch. Yeah. Um, and so this one, you know, on paper, I think at the beginning of the year when we were doing our previews, this may have seemed like seemed like a shoe-in North Carolina State victory. I'm not going to change my tune. I think they're still the better team. They're better on defense. Um I think they can be better on offense. Uh, they've not been great so far on offense, uh, but I think they if they play <laughs> they play the way they should play, they'll be fine. Uh, Donovan Smith has played pretty good, pretty solid quarterback for Texas Tech. I, I think that slows down a little bit this week. Um, he's turned the ball over a little bit. That's been a bit of an issue. Uh, he's already got three interceptions, so that's something to keep an eye on in this game. I think for me, North Carolina State wins this game. Let's see what I have on. I actually only have this at a four, though. I think Texas Tech might be a little bit tougher out um, because of what they can do offensively uh, than it might have been going into it a couple weeks ago. So North Carolina, uh, North Carolina State, Wolfpack wins it for me, but it's only a four. So this is only a three for me, so we have a similar feeling. We're very close. I'm picking, I'm picking NC State. I think – so this – that first game of the year was at East Carolina, and I – when we did some about preview, or not some about preview, when we did Conference USA preview, I said East Carolina was a team to watch. Whenever we talked about week one, which can't you keep an eye on, because I don't think it was part of a pick em, we both said NC State East Carolina is a game to watch. It's a game to keep your eye on. So that one, being in Greenville, I th- and I watched a good chunk of that game, that crowd was great for East Carolina, mm-hmm. and they were they were on top of them from the very first second. So I mean, it was kind of a an interesting environment to start the year for NC State. That defense for East Carolina played great. So they, I mean, they snuck out with the victory. They got the Charleston Southern game. They put up fifty five at home. I think they they ironed out a lot of kinks. This one's also at home. I'm giving the edge to NC State because it's at home. I think last week's game, you know, they're like, all right, this is we're playing our style of play. We're able to do what we're used to doing. We're getting into a rhythm. I think that's going to help. And I like NC State's defense as well. I think they're going to be able to cause some turnovers against Texas Tech. So I'm going to give the slight edge to them. Um, I think they're going to have everything worked out, plus it's at home. Uh, perfect. Next up, Patrick, we got Michigan State taking on Washington. Both teams are 2-0. and Michigan State, number 11 in the country. Man, Patrick, for me, I'll just go ahead and say it. This is my one confidence um, because I think – you look at what Peyton Thorne's done, already, done so far this season. It looks – his stat line looks good until you look at how many times he's turned the football over. I think that's a problem when you've played Western Michigan and you've played Akron and you've turned the ball over three times and you're the number 11 team in the country. That's something to keep an eye on. Obviously, what they look. This is a great balance team. Uh, look at 234 yards, 234 and a half yards passing per game, 228 yards rushing, uh, and a half yards rushing per game. So offensively, they're very, very balanced. With defensively, they play good defense. Obviously, it's hard to tell because they play Western Michigan and Akron. Um, but look, you look on the flip side, and again, this is kind of hard because they neither team has played a good football team yet. 
Kids yeah. ready to start the season for for Washington and then in Portland State last week. What I will say and what why this is my one is because what what did we talk about in the Pac-12 uh, preview with Washington? We talked about Michael Penix Jr. being there and being reunited with one of his old coaches and having played very well under that one coach. What have we seen him do so far? Well, he's thrown for almost 700 yards, six touchdowns, one interception. That's not a bad start to the season. And granted, again, it's not against great opponents, but what we've seen them do, we talk about, you just finished talking about transfers a minute ago. We've seen him transfer in and, and be integrated into this offense early because they got two warm-up games to start with before having to go in and play a team who's who should be way better on paper still, I think. Um, yep. And, you know, obviously ranking-wise, they're way better. And... and it's hard to say struggled, but when you look offensively, they've not been crazy good on offense, right? Like you look, look on the flip side, you look at, you look at Washington again, they've not turned the ball over. They've scored points the way they're supposed to. And, and to some degree, there's a little bit of, Hey, you've done what you're, you've done your job. You did what you were supposed to do. Great. Awesome. You know, both sides of this, who can really tell, but I worry about the turnovers that Peyton Thorne's already had. And you're playing a team that's got a better defense in Washington, um, than the defenses they've seen so far. If he turns the football over and Penix Jr. plays as good as he's been playing, man, I, I think Washington could be – I'm putting Michigan State fully on upset alert. Obviously, they're my number one. I'm picking Michigan State, but I'm also putting them on upset alert. Or did I just talk myself into picking Washington? It's at Washington. I've done it. Patrick, I'm changing it. Washington it is. You're picking the upset. I'm picking the upset. And you, you're keeping it at a one. Keeping it at a one, but I'm picking the upset. So I'm picking the upset, and I've got it at a five. Ooh. Okay. So I, I mean, I thought Michigan State was very overranked coming in the year because what kept it in most of those games was was Kenneth Walker. Kenneth Walker is in Seattle now. I'm not a big Peyton Thorn guy. No. I mean, I, they've played nobody. It's like we don't, we really don't know what their identity is right now without Ken Walker. Like, that's really what saved him in a lot of ways last year and kept him in a lot of these games. And he's not there. Yeah. And I think this Washington team, while well, again, we see that they haven't played anybody, you mentioned they haven't turned the ball over a lot. I think Penix is so much more comfortable mm-hmm. back with this his old coach back into this old style and, you know, at home against Washington, I think you think about those better Washington teams when they were, you know, on the rise, you know, top 25 team, especially that year where they were in the playoff, those games, especially those night games in Washington, those were electric. Yeah. It's a hard place to play. It, it could be a hard place to play. And I understand this isn't late in the year where you know, it's not like an extremely cold game. And, and Michigan State has those as well. So that wouldn't affect him like it would others. But I really think they have the better quarterback. I think they have the better defense. If they're at home. It could be a better environment. Especially if they're 2-0 and against the top 15 team in the country who thinks overrated. I've got an upset alert, and I I feel co- more confident than you do, especially with my confidence points. But I think the Huskies are going to have this one. I yeah, I think we're both on board with that. I I can I talked it through and convinced myself. Yeah, you know, sometimes the fun of getting to talk through picks is that yeah. I start talking. I'm like, you know what? No, no, no. Actually, so we'll probably both be wrong because I changed it. Uh, next up, Patrick, we got UCF. Taking on uh, Florida Atlantic, who's who's sitting at two and one. They played week zero, so that's why they've got the extra week. UCF sitting at one and one. Um, games against South Carolina State uh, and Louisville. They lost that game to Louisville last week. Uh, on the other side, you've got well, wins against Charlotte and Southeast Louisiana, and then a loss to uh, at Ohio. Um, look, here's the deal. This is gonna this is, this is probably a game that if you can find, you want to watch because this is gonna be electric on offense on both sides. Yeah. Um, Central Florida, we know from the last several years. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different with Gus Malzahn being the head coach there, who 
we know Matt doesn't like as a head coach, um, but it is what it is. Um, I, John Reese Plumley has played fine so far. Um, I, I think uh, they'll continue that. I man, I'm almost tempted to talk myself into Florida Atlantic. Nikosi Perry is uh, again an electric quarterback. You get him and their running back has been pretty darn good. 43 carries, 303 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, not too shabby. So that's what I'm trying to think of what that average is, but that's over six yards a carry, I think, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, probably over six. Um, and then Wester has been 15 catches, 222 yards, three touchdowns. So you're talking about a team that has put up some points. Now, again, they've not necessarily played anybody, and, and defensively they're not in a ton to write home about. Um, but I think this game is going to have some fireworks. I think it's going to be fun. Oh man, do I? Am I gonna have Florida Atlantic at a one? This is your one confidence. This is my one. I'm. It didn't matter who I picked. I'm least amount confident in either of these. Okay, you know what? You've convinced me. I'm moving this down to my two, and I'm gonna. I've been talking myself into Florida Atlantic this whole time. I'm gonna move it to a two early. I mean, a Louisville. Oh, there you go. There's the answer. Louisville's not a good team, and I watched them struggle last week. Do able to do much of anything against Louisville? Um, I I'm honestly not a big John Reese Plumley fan. Whenever they brought him in, granted he's playing football and baseball, which I don't. That means nothing in this argument, but like. I was like, really? It, it was kind of like with the Bonex. Like, really? Yeah. That's who you're bringing in? Like, he really didn't even move the needle whenever he he did have the job in Ole Miss. And, like, they really only use him as, like, a hybrid type guy, kind of like a um, like an H-back type, can light up a wide receiver. Well, but that's – Basically, that's where- hates him, he'll kind of kind – of, Type of guy. That's what, um, that's what Gus Malzahn wants from his quarterback. I mean, Patrick, you and I sat through a season of watching Freddie Knight and play quarterback at Arkansas State. Like, I, this is that's what he wants from a guy, which is why I don't trust his offense. If he doesn't have a guy like Cam Newton playing quarterback for him, his offense isn't that great. I, outside, of, I, I think at the high school, which is what's weird because at the high school level, his offense was so. Um, it was a little bit different because they threw a lot of screens. Uh, Damian Williams, there's your name. They throw it to Damian Williams. Uh, throwing a bunch of bubble screens uh, is how they really, really got really good at Springdale. Um, but even you go back and look at what he did at, at Shiloh Christian. We're Arkansas folks, so we we know these schools. Like I, I played against Shiloh Christian several times. Gus Malzahn was long gone by then, but they were still trying to run that same offense. And it was, I mean, you go look at the record books for the state of Arkansas, and it's just Rhett Lashley, like, or it used to be. It may not be anymore, but for the longest time, every passing thing was Rhett Lashley playing a child of Christian because they just threw the football a ton. And that is not what he has settled into. And I think that's been to his detriment because, look, you've got Bruce Pumley, who is the leading passer and the leading rusher. It's not usually a a great sign because if you can stop him, you stop your offense. If you can stop one aspect of his offense, you make him very one dimensional. You make the offense very one dimensional. I, I think, again, this is why I'm not a big Gus Malzahn fan. When he went there, I was like, Ugh, that's a step back from Josh Heupel, which is a weird thing to think about. But obviously, Josh Heupel's having success at Tennessee now, so whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Florida Atlantic wins this game. I'm not super shocked about it. Patrick, let's move on to the last game because we've got to talk some NFL uh, as well. Miami Hurricanes, number 13, taking on the Texas A&M Aggies, who are sitting still at number 24 after their loss to App State, which, like, kudos to the to the polls for not over overreacting to them losing to a good App State team and dropping them, like, way too far. Um, but I'll say this. Miami's the better team here because I think – Texas A&M has some major issues in it. It derives from their quarterback position. Haynes King is not a good enough quarterback, I think, to make the rest of this offense a very good offense. And on the other side of that, Van Dyke's played 
very good so far. I think, again, granted, they played Bethune, Cookman, and, and Southern Mississippi, so take that for what you will. But he's done what he's supposed to do. Parrish has been running the ball really, really well for Miami so far. I, I think this is an offense that's going to come in that is confident right now that has some great skill to it. And I think you're going to see – I mean, look, Texas A&M is going to come off – you can play this one of two ways. Are they going to be, like, super upset that they lost last week and try and kill Miami? problem with that is sometimes you overcorrect, and because you try too hard, you end up playing a worse game. And I, I think I worry Haynes King, three touchdowns, two interceptions. I worry that a guy like Haynes King is going to come in and try to do too much and then – cause even more problems. So I actually have Miami winning this game. And let me see. I think I have this as – I've got it as my six. I think I, – I feel that good about Miami winning this game that, that I've got them at six. I've got A&M uh, losing a second game early in the season and soon to be followed by a third when they lose to Arkansas. Yeah, so this is the puzzling thing about A&M. Like, they spent millions and millions of dollars on um, – this freshman class, and I'm sure they brought transfers. Like they spent so much money on NIL to bring these kids in, and their answer to quarterback was Haynes King. Like yeah. you, you're willing to shell out so much money, and that's what you want to do at quarterback. Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure they? He's going to lead you all the way to a, a national championship. He's going to lead you. Granted, you beat Alabama once last year. But, like, he's going to lead you to beating Alabama again and, and beating Georgia, and beating an Ohio State. Like, that's what's going to do it. No. Are you sure? Because I can tell you how it's going to play out. You're not going to sniff the playoff. You're not going to sniff an SEC championship game. And here is what we're seeing. Struggled, yeah, against App State. Struggled. I forget who they play week one, but they struggled week one. And I'm telling you, they played Sam Houston. It was a yes, but I'm sure I'm going to keep bringing this up. But you're going to see them go on a losing streak, and there it's only going to get worse when they play SEC games. What we're going to see in January. Is all this money that you shut on NIL deals? You're going to see them enter the portal and walk away. Yeah. Because you spent all this money to bring all these kids in to get a top five recruiting class. And then you just crap the bed, have a terrible year. Like, why? I don't need to. Because I can go make this money that you paid me anywhere else. Because I earned it based off of my name and my image. So I can go earn the same money elsewhere because it's still the same name and the same face. So why do I need to be at AN? Well, so, we clearly suck. I, so the answer to my question, like Miami's the better team. They have the better quarterback. I I, I think they have a better coach. Yeah. Yeah, I said it. They have the better. I think you're right. Here, here's the money. I'm a coach, so I have this as my seven. Miami wins. Yeah, here, here's the problem with this game. If you're Texas A&M, is I, we talked about in the SEC preview. Uh, so go back and listen to that at any point in time and tell us we're wrong. But if you go back and look at listen to that, what was the who was my player to watch? Devin Chain was my player to watch. What has he done? He's done nothing because his offensive line hasn't played good. And this offensive line not playing good has meant that they've not run the football really well. And since they've not run the football really well, that doesn't set Haynes King. And look, we get, we've given Haynes King a hard time so far. Yeah. It's not his fault. He is he is being set up for no, failure. It's not. It's, not, not it's definitely not like he should be the scapegoat or anything like that. No. Right. Jimbo should be the scapegoat because their inability to run the football is why Haynes King has struggled. And Haynes King struggling is why they struggled um, against App State especially. But, you know, again, didn't just – I mean, look, again, Sam Houston State's the most successful program in the state of Texas um, in the last couple – in the last decade. Uh, I like to throw that out with UT fans. Uh, down. Um, but – They've not played great for two games, really. 
the way they should have played for two games if they're the team that everybody acts like they should have been at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And if you can't do that against those two, when you run into a good team, you're not going to be any better. And the way you offset that is running the football. And if you can control the line, really, if you can just control the line of scrimmage in general, you're in a lot better place. I don't think they've been able to do that. I don't think they're going to be able to do that against Miami. Miami wins, and I'm obviously you and I both are not fairly – I'm confident, even though the rest of the country seems to be pretty confident that Miami will win, my or that that A and M will win. Uh, it's a little bit SEC bias, but uh, so there it is. That is that's our college picks. Um, we uh, again, make sure you go join the pick. I mean, even if you join it late, it's just fun to keep up with what everybody's doing. Um, so, Bad Ass and the Chief 2022 is the name of that one. Um, all right, let's see where's where's the wife at. Ooh, she's doing she's doing better than than both. Actually, well, she's tied with you in terms of picks, but she's two points better. Um, so was it? Well, I tied me and you tied each other last week. Nice. Um, so there's that. Those are our college picks, Patrick. Let's move on now to a part that to a thing that we haven't got to do in a long time. It is time for some shames. Shame, shame! I know your name. All right, Patrick. Who gets a shame for you this week? So I'm going to have an interesting one. Okay. So we don't talk a lot of tennis on the show. Ooh, okay. In fact, we don't talk tennis at all. Well, I don't know. I couldn't tell you the last time we talked tennis. I don't know if we ever have. But I'm going to, for my shame, we're going to talk tennis. Because we're seeing two greats retire mm. so it's it's a semi it's a it's an actual sh- sad shame not it's a, a sad shame it's not like mm. yeah it's not like oh someone got in trouble or, or something like that. <laughs> it's a shame that we're seeing some of the great like or that we grew up watching like it, it just proves that we're getting old yeah you know what i mean <laughs> we're seeing saying it so patrick yeah exactly you know we're seeing this new wave in all sports. And I, I mentioned tennis because it, it comes so quickly right now. Yeah. Serena Williams. And then today, Roger Federer yeah. just announced his retirement. So we've seen one of the greats in men's tennis. We've seen the GOAT in women's tennis. Both retire. And both have had outstanding careers on, on either side. Yeah. So it's... A, I mean, kudos to the both of them. You tip your cap, but it's a shame that we are seeing this. Uh, or, I mean, it's not like we looked up to, to tennis stars, you know. But it's a shame that we're seeing some of the greatest that we've seen for so long dominant the sport. Hang well, it up. And just an end of an era. Like it's always, it's yeah. you know, uh, it's always weird when uh, you think about really even for most of our at least adult life for sure um and really with serena probably even a little bit longer than that um and serena felt like most of my just entire life right like you're talking about like, like people that we've seen constantly win tournaments and, and it's a weird it's a weird thing to be like okay well now i gotta figure out who the next who the current goat is really, yeah or, now now what? you really have to like all right i'm seeing these names like who is this person well and it's, it's you, always, upset. you see this Someone winning this this grand slam. I was like, all right, well, yeah. Who are these people? So uh, yeah, that's that's a good shame for uh, an actual sad shame um, for uh, the sport of tennis. Patrick, quickly, mine is also a sad shame. The dream is dead. I had to use that one because Jamal Adams is out for the season again. Patrick, torn quad. Um, He's is. I was talking about, about this with someone today. Is he still the highest paid safety? He might be. And look, I, I am not, and this is, you know, talk talk bad about Seahawks fans again. Um, this is an interesting, uh, people want to poo-poo this, the trade that, that got Jamal Adams, you know, giving up two firsts, I think it was, and some uh, two firsts and a second maybe, or two firsts and a third or something to get. I forget what it was. Um, two firsts for sure. Anyway. This is not. I th- I still hold up that it wasn't a bad trade because Jamal Adams is not a guy who had injury history prior to the trade, and then all of a sudden he's just 
he can't stay healthy, man. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it sucks because I think, I think not from a Seahawks fan. I mean, it sucks from a Seahawks fan perspective, but it sucks in general because I think he is an, a super fun player to watch when he's healthy. Um, I, I think, you know, he's just a good football player. I, I, I'm not going to say that I thought he was going to end up being the next Cam Chancellor because no way was going to be the next Cam Chancellor. But, you know, it was fun to see a guy who had potential to maybe get to a Cam Chancellor sort of era or sort of sort of area. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I forget when his contract runs out, but it's going to be interesting to see if the Seahawks want to try another season with him. Um, maybe you, if his contract does run out, you could sign him to kind of a one-year prove-it deal um, and maybe see what happens. But, man, it just uh, it sucks because you want to see – uh, you will see guys like that play like, uh, you know, similar to your, your shame of seeing Serena and, and Roger Federer retire. Like you want to see good players play. And I, I think Jamal Adams is a good player. So it's sad to, to miss out on him playing, but those are our shames. Patrick, let's definitely get into our NFL good. Pick. Definitely a good one. Yeah. Let's get into our NFL picks for the week. Um, obviously right now uh, it's Thursday night when we're recording this. If you're watching it live, obviously it's Thursday night for you as well. Um, so we won't talk about it for long. We got chargers chiefs on right now, Patrick, we both picked this morning. Um, our good friend Roger, who takes care of our, our season long uh, between you, me, our good buddy Alec, and Roger, um, who, who our old Arkansas State Sports Information uh, pick 'em group. Um, right. He takes those. I pick the Chiefs. You pick the Chiefs as well, right? Yeah, we both. I think all all four of us, if I remember, ended up. Yeah. Kansas City uh, gifts. So that's obviously. As of right now, the Chiefs are ahead in that game. Next up, Patrick. So let's go straight to Sunday. We've got the New York Jets at 0-1 taking on the 1-0 Cleveland Browns. Patrick, for me, Cleveland Browns get this win again, uh, especially as, as since Brownie the Elf is making his reappearance on the field. Um, I think between – nothing. I mean, there's going to be juice in the stadium because of that. Like That's one of those weird things that's going to get people excited. Um but you're playing the Jets, and the Jets have no quarterback. Um, and this is a league that if you have no quarterback, with Jacoby Brissett is the best quarterback on the field, you're probably in trouble. Yeah. And on top of that, the Jets just don't have any defense. So, yeah. I, I'm Cleveland's going to run the ball over them. So, how, how long do you – How long just, of a leash do you think Robert Sala has there? How, how many years do you think they'll let him go? I hope he has a long one because here's my thing. The more – the quicker the revolving door is for this franchise, the longer you're going to suck. Yeah. So, like, my thing is if the, if the man who has the keys to the car that's putting – like, that is – let me say this. If the man who's has control of putting the roster together has a longer leash than the coach who doesn't have much say in the roster itself in terms of free agents and drafting and all that, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what it is for yeah. the Jets. Which, I mean, they keep giving themselves – more more opportunities to draft high in the first round. They keep giving themselves opportunities to draft more times in the first round. So they keep giving themselves not only better shots at the dartboard, but more darts to throw at the dartboard yeah. with all the picks. And then they are always like top five, top ten in salary cap. So, I mean, they keep trying to spend the money. They keep trying to land all these picks and then – I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many darts you have board. If you don't know where to throw it and you don't know how to spend your money, it's never going to work. Yeah. I, you know, there's something to be said about the uh, Pittsburgh Steeler form of, of coaching in terms of not getting rid of coaches uh, very often and letting them actually stick around and do something that I think, I think Robert Sal is going to end up being a good coach down the road. And I think you don't, not down the road. He's a good coach right now. I, I think you don't want to be, you don't want to get rid of him too early um, because you're trying to win now when you're not putting a roster together that can actually win now. Um, 
but we both got the Browns. Next up, Patrick, we got the 1-0 Commanders taking – ugh, I hate that I just said that. The 1-0 Washington football team taking on the 0-1 Detroit Lions. I, to me, this is going to be a tight one. I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, the Commanders are better than we thought they were, and the Lions are who they thought who we thought they were. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think this is a case of both teams kind of tipped the scales one way Last week, my arms are too. I got to like T Rex arm it to get it in there in, in, in screen. Um, I, I think the tail skipped one way, and I think we'll see them kind of balance back out this week. I've got Detroit winning this game, actually. So the Detroit's at home. They showed that they can tank with most teams after losing in a one score game to Philadelphia. So, I mean, you can call it the you know, hard knocks bump or, or, or whatever. I think they're a well-coached team. They know what it takes to win. They're trying to put the pieces in place. I think they're a team kind of opposite of the Jets. They're, you know, a bad organization. They have a good coach in there. I really like Campbell. I think he's a good coach. You know, they don't have – two, three first round picks. They usually, you know, have the one in this case in this year they had two. But, you know, they're drafting good players. Penne Sewell is a great offensive lineman. In fact, outside of Slater, was one of the only good offensive linemen in last year's draft. They've got Aiden Hutchinson who made an impact early. In that first game, and I think he's he's going to be a great football player. We know what Jamison Williams can do whenever he gets healthy, and a lot of people expect the same great thing. So it's going to give them another offensive weapon, and they have a lot of weapons. Look what they got last year in Amara St. Brown. He wasn't a first round talent. Yeah. Look what they got, and you saw in Hard Knocks, Rodrigo. He was a six round pick out of Oklahoma State, and he's yeah. a starting linebacker. I mean. Jerry Jacobs, you remember him from Arkansas and Arkansas State, being a great quarterback. He was an undrafted free agent last year. We haven't seen him because, you know, he's on IR, I believe, because he tore his Achilles race Yale very late in the season last year. Yeah. So, and you can say about Okuda, whatever. But they've hit more recently than they missed. Yeah. Because they have – probably have a better scouting department. They have better minds in the organization. And I think they have an owner who's letting them do their job. Yeah. And so, to say all that, commanders, they started off, they they were really streaky against Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just think Detroit has it, has it put together more. So I'm picking one. Yeah, I think – and I think that's a good thing to keep in mind with this Detroit team. Is that I think they're a lot, they're closer. I think they're they're at the tipping point of becoming a really good football team, um, and just kind of need some things to happen. And this is kind of going to be one of those good games where you you kind of see some stuff start to come together. And Jared Goof is their quarterback. I have, always have to remind people of that. So that's you know question mark. Okay. But he's not the worst okay. quarterback option that you could have. Um, but I am I am also picking Detroit. Next up, Patrick we've got Tampa Bay taking on the New Orleans Saints. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Jameson, James Winston's banged up. Alvin Kamara's banged up. Mark Ingram's banged up. Um, Cam Jordan's banged up. You, you look at all the guys who haven't practiced this week. It's quite a quite a long list. Um, James Winston having back issue is a big is a big thing to me because anytime you've got a quarterback who's struggling, who struggles to not turn the ball over anyways, um, but has a, a, a twingy back. I, that's something to keep an eye on. They'll obviously, I'm sure, give him like 18 shots, and he'll be physically for a little bit. But if he gets sore, I, I think they got some question marks. It's Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay's going to have some has some injury questions too, a little bit on their on their offense with their playmakers. But I think they'll be fine. They got Tom Brady. They'll be fine. Tampa Bay for me. I'm going to go different here. I'm going to go with the Saints. Okay. So you're allowed. As long as, as, long as Brady has been in Tampa, which hasn't been very long. But Tampa has seemed to struggle in recent years against New Orleans when they play on the road in New Orleans. I didn't really like what I saw 
with the Bucks, especially offensively, playing against Dallas. I know Dallas is an improved defense. They're not historically a good defense. I think New Orleans, granted, they've got several names on the injury list that you mentioned. They're still very similar defensively. They have a great defensive line. We know what they have at linebacker with Demario Davis. You know, they're loaded pretty well on the defensive backside. And offensively for Tampa, you know, their offensive line is really weak right now. Outside of um, Mike Evans, I don't really know what they have. Does Julio really have the juice? I'm not, uh, you know, can he do it for a whole season? Because Chris Godwin, you know, he he's hurt. They don't really, have, they don't have Gronk, so I don't know what they really have tight end wise. You could really see Brady try to force it in some ways to the tight ends, and just wasn't working. They were clicking, and that's going to be an electric atmosphere. I'm going to go New Orleans. Okay, you're you're allowed to be different than me. That's okay. Uh, next up, you're going to walk. Yeah, we don't. We we're, we're rarely we rarely go against each other, which means we don't argue much. Uh, next up, Patrick, we got the Carolina Panthers taking on the New York Giants. Uh, maybe a little bit of a surprising New York's one to know. Carolina. Um, I'm going to take Carolina to win this game. I know it's in New York. I, I think I think Baker probably you – know, we talked about playing – I forget what game was it. We talked about a, a team trying to play too hard, uh, A&M. I, you know, I, think, I think you saw last week Baker tried to play a little too yeah. – a little too much with a chip on her shoulder, and yeah. sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. We saw it not work last week. I think they kind of come back down a little bit uh, in a good way this week and, and and get the win over New York. I don't. I just don't trust the New Yorks figured it out yet. I don't say they figured it out, but at the same time, like I really think that this is the staff that's going to get them there. I'm not surprised at all that they beat Tennessee. I know it was a very close game. Oh, you don't like Tennessee this year at all? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. But if you look back at our pick, our pick em group that we do with with Roger in the game, like I, I mean, I picked the Giants, oh. and I was pretty confident in that. And granted, I didn't think it was going to go to the last second, but I was pretty confident in the Giants winning that one. Um, I like what they're able to do on offense. They got a lot of weapons. They're slowly loading up that offensive line. Um, I'm not gonna say Saquon's back. I'm still hesitant to say that, but he looked really good. He looked like vintage Saquon. I'm not saying he is. He can be back. Player. Is he going to be back on the yeah, I just need to, I need to see it again. Yeah, but I just don't know what I, what I'm getting with Baker. Um. He's obviously playing with a new group. I don't think it helps him that he was traded so late, so he didn't have just a ton of time dealing with this new offense, dealing with his wide receivers. Carolina, you know, like still has a bad offensive line. Um, we're finally going to see Kayvon Thibodeau um, playing this game. Uh, obviously, you know, of course it's the home opener. Um, but they're getting one of their first-round picks. Um, alongside with Evan Neal, I get. I it's not like I'm feeling great about Daniel Jones, but I just feel better about this Giants team as a whole. So I'm not. We're gonna go different again. I'm picking the Giants. All right, that's cool. Uh, you're allowed. So <laughs> right now, I don't know if you're watching, but man, just, uh, Herbert looks hurt. Yeah. Herbert. yeah. If, you, if you're watching the video, you see me look occasionally. Our TV in the living room is just a teeny bit out of, out of yeah. uh, just a little bit to it's see. Off, like right in front of him, but he is in pain. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't look very comfortable. Um, speaking of a team that uh, it was a pain to watch last week, uh, both of these teams, New England's taking on Pittsburgh. Uh, New England 0-1, Pittsburgh 1-0. Mac Jones is a little bit banged up. This Pittsburgh team's not good, but I don't necessarily think this – New England team was great last week either. Pittsburgh at home, I'm going to give them the win this time. I, I think, you know, if you're talking about a banged up Mac Jones and you're talking about a healthy Mitch Trubisky, I don't like that quarterback. I won't be watching this game Sunday. I'll put it that way. Um, 
But the, this Pittsburgh defense, even my, without T.J. Watt, which is another shame that we could have thrown out there. Um, uh, he'll be back this year. He'll be back. Yeah, I you know that's a I trust that defense a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to pick Pittsburgh. I'm paying them too, man. <coughs> Patriots just look bad. They look bad. And that game against Miami, which but you know what, is, they is a much improved team, and they're 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 slowly climbing up there. Um, and we're one of the few people who talk about how they're getting there on defense. Yeah, everyone wants to talk about Tua and, and, and his development in the league, but I feel like we're the only people who talk about how they keep getting better and better and better on defense. Yeah, well, and it clearly showed last week. Um, I think it's important not to overreact with this Patriots team because they always struggle in Miami. Um, I can't help but do it, though. But they're also not – I don't think they're that good. I, yeah, I can't help but but feel that way. Yeah. So, And I I was very low coming in the year. I was lower than you were. I'm not saying that this, you know, this Pittsburgh team is just great, but I don't even care if it was a healthier Mac Jones. Like – I, I, I'm just not – you know I'm not feeling this Patriots team. I'm definitely not feeling them now. Give me the Steelers. Okay. Next up, Patrick, we've got the Jacksonville Jaguars at home, 0-1, taking on the 0-0-1 Indianapolis Colt. Patrick, I'll let you go first. Who wins this game? So, I – at work, I sit behind a guy who is from Florida. He's a big Jacksonville guy. So, um, you know, kudos to him for sticking with this team. Exactly. Um, I don't know this man. We're talking, about this, we're talking about this game, and, you know, we talk about for one, Indianapolis always struggles in Jacksonville, whether they play that game towards the very end of the year or the very beginning of the year. They always struggle in Jacksonville. And the one thing that I'm really worried about, obviously, Jacksonville is slowly just building depth at the edge rush, which every year it feels like they draft a new defensive end in the first round, building up Saxonville. And Indianapolis is struggling right now in the bookends of the offensive line. You know, they, for whatever reason, won't address the left tackle position. And when they try and do it, it never works. Much to your Raymond Smith isn't looking that good right now. No. And, you know, that was a guy that they drafted, I believe, second round in 2018 draft out of Auburn, who we thought was, you know, a great find. And right now he's not playing that great. So for what used to be a really, really solid group is starting to go back to, you know, kind of like Swiss cheese. Yeah. Four holes. Now, Quentin Nelson obviously is the star. He just got paid last week, but it really worries me. I really wish we could go back and address that. But having said that, like as long as Pittman is healthy, I think that fourth quarter against Houston really showed some promise. Um, shouldn't have taken four quarters, but it's what happens whenever you sign an old man, Matt Ryan, who fumbles every every other snap. Um. But on the other side, Lawrence kind of looks like the same guy we saw last year. Once he saw pressure, he kind of gets scared and makes quick decisions and doesn't focus on his reads and forgets where his players are. He just gets it out of there as quick as possible. And I think that's how you beat them defensively. I think Shaquille Leonard's going to be back and play this game. So I think it's going to be an ugly one. And I, I hate to jinx it just because of how bad we have been there, but I do think that Indiana, it's going to be like a, and whatever, however you feel, I'm glad Hot Rod's gone. It was atrocious last game. <laughs> I think we, I think we went a close one. It's going to be a one score game, and Colts fans are going to be like, oh, it's going to be a bad year. I'm like, well, it's, we're seeing this conference improve. Yeah. We're just seeing them start to make better decisions. But it's gonna be an ugly one, but I think I think Indianapolis takes it. 
Well, it wasn't long ago that this conference was one of the tougher conferences in the league. Um, and, you know, if Jacksonville can get back to <laughs> – this is a weird thing to say, but the Blake Bortles era. Um, oh, wait, hey, that, they were a couple of plays away from a Super Bowl. Fan, look, so I hate that weird. Weird. No one – people <laughs> like, to, like to crap on him, but he was not, almost – he almost took Jacksonville to the Super Bowl, so – Oh, look, not to sidebar this too much, we're talking about Blake Bortles, but you know I was hardcore against them getting rid of Blake Bortles. I thought that was a terrible decision. And then, look, it really kind of has been a terrible decision. They've kind of been trying to struggling to figure that out ever since then. Um, well, Casey just kicked the goal. I don't have my glasses on. I can't see very well. Um, but it looks like they did. And uh, Herbert still looks like he's really, really hurt. Um uh, but look, I, I think you're right. This this is just a comfort or a, a division that's improving, and you're going to see it be a tougher division to win year in, year out, especially as long as Jacksonville starts getting better and is no longer a punching bag. And Houston um, isn't quite the punching bag that we all thought they might be the last couple of years. I think the Colts are going to be okay. This is, I think this the start to the season is going to be rough, and people, Colts fans are going to panic. Don't hit the panic button yet. I, I think it will take several games for Matt Ryan to get kind of settled in and um, figure everything out. And, you know, I, look, I wasn't a huge fan of the Matt Ryan, Ryan signing. I thought it was kind of a black signing to begin with. Um, the only thing that I was excited about is, you know, we finagled our way to, to not only trade for Matt Ryan, but still end up moving up in the second round. In the draft, so that was the only thing I like. It's like I think we improved a little bit at quarterback, moved up in a draft where we didn't have a first round pick. Yeah, and that was that was what I got more excited about, which is the football nerd in me. Right, it's like okay, yeah, we got a quarterback, but look what we did in the draft. Yeah, I, I think that the problem for you is going to be that this team is going to be very Matt Ryan-esque, which means they're going to look very, very good at times. They're also going to look very bad at times, and yep. it's just a matter of when they hit which of those peaks and valleys. I think they win this game. I think it's going to be ugly, like you said, but I, I do think they end up winning it. Next up, Patrick, let's go to Miami. Or well, let's go to Baltimore. They talk about the Ravens taking on the Miami Dolphins. Both teams want to know. I, this is one of those games that I think everybody's going to – the sexy pick here is going to be to pick Baltimore because Lamar looked good last week. But like you mentioned earlier, I think this Miami team is a lot better on defense than everybody gives them credit for. Um, I think they're figuring out their offense. Uh, I think this is a scary, dangerous team in Miami. I think Miami wins this game. I do too. I do too. Mm. I am still – it's been one game. They play the Jets, so that tells me nothing. Right. I still don't really believe what Baltimore has with the wide receiver group. So they have um, – they always have Bateman, which I think is good. I think he's solid. But even though I claimed him a few times in fantasy football, I just don't know if Devin DuVernay is going to be able to win games as your, your – well, technically your third option – for the receiver because Mark Andrews and I think that's how you can really shut them down. Yeah. You look at the stats, Mark Andrews did not have a good game. Yeah. He didn't have a good game receiving once, which is the Jets, so you can do whatever you want. Like you can bully them no matter who you are. But I mean that's gonna be in crucial situations, that's gonna be who he looks for. And if you shut him down, then that takes away really a good chunk of what Lamar can do. And the yeah. other really thing that Lamar can do is run. So yeah. if you if you shut down his favorite target and you make sure he can't run anywhere, what, what else do you got? Yeah. So I, I think so I, I've got Miami. And, and another thing that I really like about Miami is I think they're going to be able to find ways offensively to get it done. Yeah. Defensively, I think they're fine. But I think offensively, they're going to be able to – put up points and take control. So, I mean, I'm with you. I like Miami in this game. So, we, you know, we, <laughs> we referred to Bo Nix as a 93 Corolla earlier. This, this they, To me, this Baltimore Ravens offense is a 
um, is a 93 Corolla with a Ferrari engine. Uh, I, was and, I was wondering where the speed was going was gonna to come in here. Like, I, like, I, like, look, obviously, we. I don't want to say – you and I don't give Lamar crap. And, and I think no, – like, I don't think he's bad or anything. Like I, I think that's – you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past. It's the hard thing of like, there's this, there's this thought process out there in, in the sports sphere that you can't talk about Lamar Jackson the same way you talk about any other quarterback. If, for people, some reason, the notion is if you're not the biggest fan of Lamar, you're a hater. And I'm, I'm not that way. I right. love, I love watching Lamar. I think he's great. Do I think there's, Places where he can improve, yeah. Do I think there's places where like Justin Herbert, Aaron Rodgers, Mahomes can improve? Of course, Absolutely. none of these are guys are perfect. You saw Joe Burrow have five turnovers last week. Yeah, you think he couldn't improve? Yeah, like and, 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 and Lamar keeps improving every year, so it's not like we're haters by any means. I, you and I are just realists about what Lamar is, and I think you look at what they built around him and that defense is I've been saying it for a few years now that defense is not Ray Lewis's defense like that's not the 2000s era uh, Ravens defense that everybody acts like they always are and then you throw it on the other side and really once you get outside of Lamar running and Mark Andrews if Mark Andrews is wide open and Lamar can hit him that is a very sketchy offense and I think this again, that's not a shot at Lamar the way a lot of people want it to be. That is a simple statement of what Lamar is as a quarterback. Lamar likes his tight end and he's fast. And if you can figure out how to, to take care of that area of the field, they didn't give him any receivers. They got rid of one of his best receivers in Marquise Brown. And that's not saying much because I don't think necessarily Mark Marquise Brown is. I, I, I didn't think he, he really did Lamar any favors. And and so you start looking at that, and I just – they've not put enough weapons around him to accentuate what he's really good at. If you can stop the run, and, and that's obviously a huge task. If you can contain him in the run game and you can shut down or contain Mark Andrews, you can do okay against this team. And I think that is th – what I'm getting at is I think that this Miami team matches up very well against – uh, this Ravens team, and that's why I think you and I have both picked them to win. Patrick, let's move on and talk about uh, the afternoon slate of games. We'll kind of get through these pretty quick because it's starting to get a little bit late for us. Um, the Atlanta Falcons taking on the Los Angeles Rams, both teams 0-1. Um, I'm going to make this quick. I think the Rams win this game, get back on schedule, and start taking care of business. Atlanta may be able to try to make it interesting, but the Rams are embarrassed and they're pissed off. And I think they're going to be just, they're going to be just fine against Atlanta. So I'm going Rams. Yeah, I think the Falcons are going to be a frisky team all year. Like they're going to, yeah. they're going to stay in games that they shouldn't be in. Yeah. Um, was that a dart? Did I just miss a dart? It was a dart. Ooh, that's a dart uh, from old Justin Herbert there. Um, let's move on, Patrick. Next up, we've got the Seattle Seahawks at one and zero, taking on the zero and one San Francisco 49ers. Uh, the division leading Patrick Seattle Seahawks and, and the the number one seed. No, uh, I don't. I think tiebreaker wise, they don't end up being number one seed yet. But um, look, this is this is going to be. I'm going to call this a don't overreact game because I don't think San Francisco in in the Ryan last week is as bad as they looked last week. I don't think Seattle looked – I don't even think they looked great after the first half last year, last week against the Broncos – well, a couple days ago against the Broncos. Yeah. That being said, Patrick, I think everybody's going to be tempted to think that the Seahawks are bad. Um, and this is what I've been saying all year. Everybody thinks they're going to tank. This is not a tanking roster. This is a – Decent roster with a bad quarterback. And I know Geno Smith played very good last week. Last week was a a middle finger game, so to speak, um, in a lot of ways. Seattle, there was no way Seattle wanted was going to lose that game. Once that game started, there was no way Seattle was going to lose that game, especially once uh, the Broncos couldn't really. I, I think I said, I don't remember if I said it to you, it was a prove me wrong game for everybody um, last week because. 
Russ only threw to tight ends. That was one of his big knocks. He only threw to tight ends in the first half. Geno looks like a world beater. They were throwing the football around. Um, they're going to be a little bit of a comeback down to earth. But Seattle kind of owns San Francisco, and so I think Seattle wins this game. Um, and I think we see a little bit more of the Trey Lance struggling. And I'm interested when the questions are going to start about does Jimmy Garoppolo need to come in if they want to salvage the season a little bit. Um, I, I think the Jimmy Garoppolo ship has sailed. If you were going to play him, you need to play him to start the season. Um, so I think Herbert – or not Herbert. <laughs> I think Trey Lance – I look at the screen. I think Trey Lance is your guy going forward um, for now and has to be. Um, so I'm picking Seahawks to win this game, but don't overreact either way. <coughs> Excuse me, still getting over a cold. I think the Seahawks start off two and zero to the start of the season, but they're not a two, they're not a world beater team. I think the San Francisco 49ers start off zero to not the worst team in the league. So uh, it's just a case of scheduling works out in their favor. Seahawks win for me. I don't know who wins this game. Ty. I don't really know. Like. So I've seen Seattle. I haven't really seen the 49ers because of that monsoon. I don't know. I still don't know what the team is. Elijah Mitchell got hurt. So, again, it's kind of like we're going to see this team for the first time. And we're going to see Trey Lance for the first time. Um, I saw what Seattle is. I don't know. Excuse me. Look to me, to me, Patrick. This I'm is going a- San Francisco, but to me, no matter which team I pick, I'm not confident. No, I, to me, this is week one for both of these teams. Yeah, I, I think that's the the best way to look at. It, but I'm going to take Seattle. I bet against them last week, and that wasn't a smart move. Next up, Patrick, we've got the Cincinnati Bengals taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys obviously like that lost ass lost. Excuse me, Dak Prescott for the for a couple weeks got the old Russell Wilson injury. It looks like essentially, um, I don't th- I don't think the Bengals are going to play as badly as they did last week all season long. Cowboys obviously are going to have to roll out Cooper Rush to play quarterback. Give me the Bengals. Yeah, give me the Bengals. I don't. To me, I'm always going to pick against Dallas. Yeah, and it's just because of the fact that they're trotting out at quarterback. Like, you're really going to tell me Cooper Rush is going to win you a game? No. But everybody keeps saying they need to trade for Garoppolo. They need to trade for, like, don't do it. Well, that doesn't well, solve your problems. You why should, would you do that? Your problem is that you got rid of your play, the playmakers that you should have kept last year, uh, yeah. i.e., mean, Amari Cooper. You, 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 look at, you look at what you were doing with Dak on the field before the injury, it was nothing. You, you still would, put up three points. You still put up basically three points. So, okay. what around him is going to be better. Like, that offensive line is still horrible right now. I'll say it. Mike McCarthy hot seat. Yes. And he absolutely should be. Yes, absolutely. Let's move on, Patrick. we got a couple more games that we need to get through uh, so we can get to bed. Houston Texans taking on the Denver Broncos. Uh, Houston obviously tied you guys. I think Denver wins this game. Again, for them, this is going to kind of be a week. Last week was week zero. I think this is going to be week one. Uh, I think Russ comes out and has a, another very good game. He played good, fine on Monday. Um, I think they win this game, and I don't necessarily think it's close. Yeah, um, I mean, Houston, all, I mean, this is an improving Houston team, but this different defense is really good. Um, I think Russ is going to be able to kind of take control in this game early. So I've got th- – there's too many playmakers for Denver, so I'm going to yeah. Including what was his name, Andrew Beck? Who is that guy? Yeah, who is that guy? Where did he come from? Uh, who knew Russ could throw to tight ends? Uh, next up, Patrick, we've got the last game of the afternoon: Arizona Cardinals 0-1 taking on Las Vegas Raiders. We're also 0-1. This is kind of a toss-up game to me, and I'm taking the Raiders. This this is going to be the offensive game that I think it's three thirty game for us. So. This is the one you need to watch because it's going to be very high scoring. Because, yeah. I mean, neither of these teams really have a defense. Um, the Raiders have pass rush, um, but Arizona doesn't have anything. So, um, if you've got fa- fantasy football wise, like this is this is where you're going to score all your points. Um, 
I really want to be able to have, reserve the right to change my pick if some of Arizona's people are healthy. Um, you can officially in the pick them. You've got until Sunday morning to make the pick. You're I mean, until the pick them. I'm not making it making it until Sunday morning for sure. That's a dangerous game. I know. Um, well, technically Sunday afternoon, as far as this is concerned. Um, but for the purpose of the show, who are you picking? Purpose of the show. Yeah, I may, I may go Raiders. You kind of talk me into it. And, we're, we're I mean, Raiders. Arizona doesn't have any type of defense. So yeah. it doesn't matter to me that much that Las Vegas doesn't have any type of offensive line. Because, I mean, what is the blitz going to do whenever you don't have the players to execute the blitz that well? What is it going to do whenever they don't have anybody who's covering um, Adams or Renfro or Waller? What is it going to do if they can't stop the run? Like yeah. so, I mean, you're going to see you're going to you're going to see classic Kyler, which is do great in garbage time. But man, you kind of talked me the other way, and I'm also going to go the Raiders. Do it. All right. Last game of Sunday, Patrick. We got the Chicago Bears at one and zero taking on the Green Bay Packers. Um, I know they won last week. Again, you got to kind of count that game as non-existent week zero to some degree playing in the rain like that. Packers didn't look great last Sunday. I'm still going to take the Packers. I think the Packers win this game. They should yeah. be the team in Chicago. So Green Bay's defense, especially run defense, looked pretty solid. Um, obviously, passing-wise, I mean, Minnesota was able to do whatever they wanted to do. But that also helps me have Jamar Jefferson. And Chicago doesn't have any type of Jefferson on that team. Um, you call him Jamar Jefferson? You mean Justin Jefferson? Justin Jefferson, not Jamar. Listen, Jefferson. We also love Jamar Chase on the show, so that's that's exactly. So you take the Packers? Yeah, I'm taking the Packers. I, I mean, obviously they struggle big time offensively, but that's what happens when you have basically a new offense, and a lot of that offensive line is injured and could be injured this week too. Um, I think it could be an ugly, another ugly game, but I think Green Bay gets it done. All right, we got two Monday night games, which they're starting at weird, fairly close together time, which is really interesting. I'm kind of unsure about. I mean, I know why they're doing it because they picked two East Coast teams, um, which is why they started. They're starting that early, but anyways, Tennessee Titans zero one taking on the Buffalo Bills. I'm spending zero time on it. I think your theory on Tennessee is more right than what my theory probably was to start the season. Buffalo's a very good football team. Buffalo wins. Zero thought effort into this Buffalo win. Last game of the week, Minnesota Vikings 1-0, taking on the Philadelphia Eagles 1-0. Patrick, I think I'm ready to say it. I think this Minnesota football team is going to be good. Um, I still have defensive question marks, but I think they're going to be really good. I think big Kirk, big game Kirk shows up. Big game Kirk uh, and Justin Jefferson mostly uh, win this game. Minnesota beating uh, Philadelphia. I think Jalen Hurts gets me some garbage time points uh, as he always does. The king of garbage time, um, even more so than Blake Bortles was. That's two Blake Bortles references in the episode. Uh, shout out big Blake episode. Um, then your win for me. So right now, I obviously it's just one game. But after seeing everything so far, these, to me, are the two winners of their respective divisions. I don't necessarily disagree. Just saying. But I think Minnesota's going to get this done. I think it's going to be the the Monday game that I watch more because I'm more interested in how Minnesota can stop Hurts and how Philadelphia's Second day can try and limit Jefferson. Um, can they stop that run game uh, this week with Dalvin Cook? They really weren't able to do against Detroit. Um, it's going to be a very much more interesting game, but I'm going to go Minnesota here as well. Okay. All right. Uh, so that is our NFL for this week. So go join the pick up for that. Matty Ice and the Chief 2022. Uh, keep up with that. Uh, obviously, you've missed a week if you haven't started it, but 
same. You can keep up with your picks after that week by week and see how it goes. Patrick, it is time now to end the show, which means it's time to do uh, something positive. We like to end the show on a positive note. Uh, so it's time to treat yourself. It's the best day of the year. Patrick, I'm going to go first because I have two technically, though they're the same. Uh, actually, I guess I only have one. Patrick, my treat yourself goes out to the Sun Belt. Treat yourself. Or should we call it the Fun Belt? Because Patrick, not only, let me see if I can find, not only did. But guess what? Cash money. I'm going to make it rain. Because Patrick, we had two wins this week. Uh, from App State and Marshall. Uh, we are obviously already mission the App State win. Um, Patrick, in that we haven't yet talk about Marshall's win. We haven't talked about Marshall's win over number number nine, number eight Notre Dame. But why don't I play the cash money drop, Patrick? Because Marshall got paid one point two five million dollars to beat Notre Dame. And AM paid App State one point five million dollars mm. to go down to uh, College Station and beat them. So Patrick my treat yourself goes out to App State. My treat yourself uh, out to uh, App State and Marshall because. Morning, please. Morning, please. All right, Patrick, who gets your treat yourself? You know who also gets the treat themselves anytime App State gets these upsets or has successful football seasons? App State baseball does because it always gets brought up. Oh, Speaking of App State, have you seen how beautiful this time of year their baseball field is? Yeah. So, yeah. That's that's who also gets to treat themselves because – and it's also a shame that we don't get a full series at that stadium. Mm. So, is that about, treat yourself? Think about how beautiful that would be. Is that showing treat yourself? No. No. no, no. Oh, okay. that, that, it's just because you brought that up. Okay. My treat yourself. Also baseball related. Yes, cool. I got to talk baseball and basketball during the fall. Goes out to Yadi and Melina and Adam Wainwright. Freak yourself. They made history for as a duo their three hundred and twenty fifth start. Yeah, so basically that. both of them starting the same game. Yeah. Because we all know that Yachty has played way more than 325. Yeah. And, of course, on top of that, they got the win tonight. Um, Both of them, more than likely, are retiring after this year. Um, I think it would get – Yachty would probably get uh, sends off – a send off from some clubs. Wainwright wouldn't. Um and it's weird because they're not really doing that. Like here lately, like Big Poppy did. Yeah. I know Jeter did. And for a while, Albert wasn't. But and I, I can't remember who it was. But somebody like before the All-Star break kind of came out and out of nowhere was like, why isn't Albert getting sent off from all these clubs? Like, think of what he's done in baseball. Right. And this is last year. He's going, he's chasing 700. He's had a phenomenal career in St. Louis. Like, why isn't he getting sent off? So, I th- it's to me, it's exciting to see this St. Louis club. It's exciting to see Albert get so close to 700. Hopefully, that is a treat yourself soon. But it's exciting to see all these guys. Play out again, but once this baseball season is over, it's going to be so sad seeing you know, Albert retire, seeing Wayne Wright go, seeing Molina finally go. Yeah. Oh, it's it's going to be tough for me to to see a brand new, and it's been tough for me in the last couple of years because I can really see it transition quickly. But next year's it's going to be really hard for me to 
to watch a team without oh, Wayne Wright, without, Wayne Wright um, without seeing Alberts in the league in general. Like all that, while you have to deal with the Seattle Mariners being the reigning World Series champs. So that'll do it for baseball, and that'll do it for this episode of Matty Ice and Chief. Patrick, we will be back next week um, for sure, probably. Make sure you're following us on all the socials. If you're watching an episode, uh, you can see it at the bottom scrolling across. Um, you can see it under our names, at Matt, uh, Matt underscore Sindelar, at Patrick underscore Howie on Twitter, at Matt, M-I-A-T-C show on Twitter and Instagram, uh, YouTube and Facebook, Matty Ice and the Chief. Uh, so make sure you like, rate, sit, review, subscribe in all those places. Watch the show if you get a chance to because um, it's maybe a little bit more fun. Other than that, that is going to do it for us. Make sure you make your picks. Make sure you tweet at Patrick and tell him how wrong he is. Make sure you go look and see that Patrick may or may not have eaten canes today. Um, (laughs) So uh, that'll do it. We'll see you guys next week. the time.